Hi, I'm Seth Bobroff. I lead the product marketing efforts at PlyOps. Thanks for having us today. We're excited to talk with you about our new product, the PlyOps Extreme Data Processor, XDP for short. I'd like to highlight, we recently announced broad commercial availability on July 27th, so we're open for business. We had a huge launch event with well over 100 or 800 registrants. If you did not catch it, the replay is on our new website at plyops.com. For those of you more familiar with PlyOps, you may notice our new logo and new branding. We're very excited about that as well. With that being said, we believe the extreme data processor ushers in a new era of accelerated compute and storage performance. Today, I'm gonna to introduce you to the PlyOps extreme data processor and how it can multiply your impact in the data center. All right, let's get going. First, a little bit about our company. Our mission is to massively ac accelerate the most challenging workloads, relational databases, NoSQL databases, analytics, AI, ML, and more. Our R&D team is based in Israel, and the business team is in San Jose, California. We built an elite team of experts in databases, flash storage, and semiconductors from across the industry. And we're backed by the biggest innovators in the industry, Intel, NVIDIA, SoftBank, Western Digital, Xilinx, and others. They see the same challenges as we do and the need for, for what PlyOps has developed. The industry has also recognized our innovation each year starting back in 2019. Most recently, we've been included in three Gartner hype cycle reports. We're very excited about that. And I believe that shows we are at the core of a new revolution in the data center. Let's look at some key trends here and the problem PlyOps is addressing. It's not surprising that flash adoption is accelerating in the data center. NVMe SSDs are easily a thousand times faster than hard drives, but they're not being fully utilized. One reason for that is Moore's law is slowing. CPU performance is on pace to double every 20 years versus historically two years. Just adding more cores to the CPU has hit a wall because they share the same memory and IO. And so we're really at a point of diminishing return. The solution has been to add more servers, more processing power and more un per unit of storage. That's the way it's always been done, right? But it's expensive and it's not good for the planet. Our customers tell us this is a problem today, no question about it, and it's getting much worse. All right, so those are the key trends. Putting all of this together, we see three major challenges for this next wave of SSD adoption. First, the server architecture is not balanced. Adding more SSDs that are a thousand times faster than hard drives is not being matched by the rest of the system. Second, software architecture deals with this by taking shortcuts. Storage engines are used by many of the applications to save data to drives. The storage engine and the process amplifies the data which drains the CPU. Space amplification, read amplification, write amplification can easily be 50 to 100 times more than needed, crushing storage and burning through Flash's lifespan. Third, reliability. You never hear about RAID 5 and Flash. It's just too slow. We see customers deploying RAID 0, RAID 10, or other methods, but they all have big trade-offs with either cost and, and or performance. We think there's a better way. And so our solution is the PlyOps Extreme Data Processor. Just as GPUs overcome processing inefficiencies to accelerate AI and advanced analytics, PlyOps XDP overcomes storage inefficiencies to massively accelerate performance and dramatically lower overall infrastructure cost. XDP is delivered in a low profile PCIe card, fits in any server, accelerates any workload, and works with any SSD. 
An important point to make is PlyOps is not selling the flash. We work with the flash that you have. We talk about our product in terms of these four value pillars, performance, reliability, capacity, and efficiency. Performance, yeah, all about acceleration. 3X is easily achievable, 15X, we have several examples of that and even higher. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Reliability, very important in the data center. We have drive fail protection that offers RAID 5 light capabilities at that are twice as fast as RAID 0 during a rebuild. Capacity, through various technologies, we let companies store up to 6x more capacity, more data on their flash than they can with software alone. Then we have efficiency. This is all about cost savings on top of everything combined, everything that I've talked about so far, so far, but also being able to use the lowest cost QLC and TLC. For us, it doesn't matter because we can deliver the same performance and higher endurance with QLC than with TLC and software. That's amazing. All right, let's get into more detail on application scaling and TCO. This comparison shows what XDB can achieve when compared to software only. Also note that the chart has different interfaces being used you know, for the comparison. We're either gonna talk about block mode or native KV interface. And there'll be more on that in a bit. So starting on the left with RocksDB, a standalone software key value store that's considered state of the art today. Many applications use it and we can deliver tens of performance improvement over that software. QLC SSDs, a low cost, high capacity option. And we make them like about 17 times faster with higher endurance than without XDP. Redis Next, a very popular in-memory database, uses all DRAM, which we all know is very expensive. We can deploy Redis on Flash and get very high performance, nearly equivalent to DRAM, but obviously at much lower cost. Next, we have a few typical database examples, MySQL, MariaDB, MongoDB, using a standard block interface, we're able to get three times the performance over software only. Then looking at TCO savings on top of the performance and, and the other benefits we talked about, you can lower cost from about 50% to 75%. And these are the same examples um, you know, that we talked about for, for performance, just looking at the TCO um, savings that we've observed that customers have told us. This really seems like magic. Customers are telling us that. Let's see how it works. All right, let's peek under the hood a bit and see how we accomplish this. Let's start from the host perspective in the upper left. We have two interfaces to access XDP from. First is standard block interface, which we know is the broadest adoption. It's ubiquitous out there. We look like any drive, any storage device, and we just show up. No software changes required. Next, we have a KV library API. It's RocksDB compatible, and there's an emerging NVMe KV standard that we also support. This is the most efficient way to access the system for even higher performance. Well, like on the previous chart, when we talked about RocksDB, that's what we're using is the KV API for that. Those IOs then come into XDP. It's all the same system. We basically treat blocks as special type of key value pairs. So everything runs through the system in the same way. The first step is we compress the data using very fast, very efficient compression. We have IP here. Um, that's very important that enables us to, to achieve that fast compression, even on top of software compression that applications may already do. Next, our hardware-based key value storage engine. 
Um, think of it as rocks DB on a chip. This is where the really hard work happens. Um, when you compress the block, you get an arbitrary size object that comes out of that. Flash, of course, has fixed block sizes. So how do you match those things up? You merge them, pack everything together, then sort them and index them for fast retrieval, then garbage collect. As updates get made to the data, deletions, et cetera, you have to unpack everything and start the whole process over again. This is what drives write amp, read amp, and space amp through the roof. From a CPU perspective, the host has to make big compromises. So this process isn't going to consume all the processing power in the server CPU. We've implemented extremely efficient algorithms and data structures, which are enormously computationally intensive. That's why XDP has the equivalent of hundreds of Xeon gold cores of RocksDB-like performance. The data is then output to a drive fail protection where we manage the data on SSDs. So if a drive fails, you can recover quickly with none of the trade-offs of traditional RAID. We don't use any hot spares and rebuilds happen automatically in the background. Then of course, everything can be encrypted. So let's click into how drive fail protection works. And customers regularly tell us it's a game changer for them, reducing downtime and protecting data at the speed of flash. They just haven't been able to do it cost effectively. This graph shows how drive fail protection performs versus non-protected software rate. You can see we normally get something like two and a half times sustained throughput or the fast software RAID zero and the blue line. We put RAID five below that for comparison purposes, and you can see we totally leave that in the dust. Progressing forward, we see an SSD crash and immediately our agent kicks in, um, kicks off the rebuild process, which happens transparently in the background. We lose some throughput because we use bandwidth from the other drives, but XDP is still two times faster than RAID zero because we're only rebuilding the data unlike RAID five that rebuilds the entire drive. That's not the only reason, but that's certainly a part of it. And because of that, database services are virtually not affected. So clients barely feel the impact of the rebuild process. It's important to note that users can tune the rebuild process, making it faster or slower. And of course, there's a trade-off with application performance. So depending upon what your needs are, you can make that, that balance um, you know, to suit your needs. The bottom line is we can store, we can restore eight terabytes of data in less than two hours, and we're back to normal operation. Pretty cool. Lastly, I want to show you the power of XDP when it comes to QLC. Customers tell us this is another game changer for them because they want to get more from their data center footprint and get achieving higher capacity you know, per node is essential for that. The chart on the left, we see an 18x performance gain for a 70-30 random read, random write workload, typical. For a 50-50 workload on the right, we see performance increase by 30x. So the message here, amazingly, the more writes you have, the more performance can be gained. Almost counterintuitive, right? XDP reduces writes by 90%, increasing overall endurance of QLC. We accomplish this by transforming random writes into sequential writes. We, and that's what really eliminates 90% of the writes, right? Um, and um, this eliminates the inherent issue with QLC and delivers a performance boost across a wide variety of workloads. XDP is any easy to integrate using standard block interface. There's no changes to any software. So using XDP, customers can confidently deploy QLC, gaining a high performance, high density, 
lower cost footprint. And with that, I'd like to open it up for some questions. I have uh, Prasad Venkatachar, who's one of our STEAM subject matter experts. He's gonna help, uh, help me with the, the question and answer session. Oh, hi, uh, Dan Frith here. I had a question around resiliency of the cards themselves. Would I, could I deploy more than one card in a host or is, it, is, it, is that how the architecture works? Um, you, can deploy, you, can, uh, you can deploy multiple cards uh, in a host, um, but there isn't a direct failover between cards. The cards are uh, extremely robust and I don't have the MTBF data um, off the top of my head, uh, but uh, what, what we're seeing is they're just as reliable or more reliable than, than a server CPU. That being said, there is provisions built into the card um, that can tolerate any unforeseen type of power failure and uh, with, with persistent memory on the card. So all the data uh, will be fully protected, even in an unexpected power failure. Um, and the data uh, can also still be accessed. So it's, it's not like the data, um, you know, if, if a card fails um, and, you know, your data is lost, your, your data is still intact. You can put a new card in and still intact, uh, still access the data. Prasad, I don't know if you, if there's anything you want to add to that. So we have seen customers using our wants to deploy also uh, more than one uh, PSP card per server. It's more from a capacity point standpoint where, uh, you know, large hyperscaler, they want to have high density storage server configuration, right? Like, you know, on its storage pod level, and that beats certain amount of petabytes at a lower cost. Yes, uh, to answer your question, yes, there is a, we support uh, deploying multiple PSPs uh, to, you know, cater to the, the needs of the hyperscalers to support that high, high density storage configuration. Hi there, it's uh, Jason Belovicic here. I have a, a question for you. Um, is this available just to the bare metal host or can I make this available to virtualization technology or containers running within the host itself? Yeah, um, I'll, give, I'll give my response and Prasad, please, please chime in. <clears throat> um, today, deployments are primarily uh, uh, on bare metal and we're working on um, you know, virtualization and, and container um, support uh, in, in the future. Hi, this is Alistair Cook. Uh, you talk about coalescing rights as part of the performance improvement. Now, normally that, that then means that you've uh, led to some performance problems on reads because they're now, what, what would be a sequential read is now a random read. Can you address the read performance and how you get really good read performance out of this coalesced uh, mingled data? Yeah, let's uh, see if I, let, let, let me see if I got your question. So how are we getting that kind of a read throughput uh, since we are kind of uh, converting the random reads to sequentially? Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, so we have, when application requests certain amount of data, right? Like, you know, we exactly know where it is stored and, uh, you know, right? So, and these all indexed and sorted and everything, we exactly know, even to the LBA level, the byte level, logical block address, so we know that. And when it has been fetched, because this is stored in a compressed format, and it will be fetched to the, there is a PLAPS, uh, PLAPS data management layer, so that will define how many decompression engines I need to kick in, how much I have to put it onto the, the PLAPS card, how much I, mean, I can put it onto the, the, the PLAPS uh, software module itself. So that way we distribute this decompression and the amount of data, which is like you know, decompressed both the, uh, from both the angles and then it is fetched back to this. So if it is a compressed, like you know, let's say three factor of three, even a two GB of this one, like, you know, you can imagine that this is six GB. Of it. So we tap, tap it up to almost 24 gigabyte of uh, day, uh, you know, throughput. Uh, so that's how we are able to accomplish that amount of, uh, uh, you know, the performance. Quick, quick question as well. Uh, Max Motilaro here, Tech and Plug. Um, I have a question which is primarily not exactly technical. So just tell me if, uh, if it's a, a bit of a, a weird one, if you don't want to reply to that. So. What you've been showing is that this installs on, on servers and you've been showing you know, several applications which can benefit 
from, from your solution. But one thing I heard, and that's one thing I've seen as well in other presentations, you've mentioned several times hyperscalers. And my question there is, of course, organizations, companies can buy that and install it on premises, but are you seeing some adoption partnerships with hyperscalers, I'm talking public cloud services, where customers could run their applications as a service and benefit from an underlying infrastructure which leverages playoffs? Is that something which exists? Is that something, is that the direction where you're going? Does it even make sense technically? You mean you mean deploying it within the service provider's infrastructure to accelerate? Yes, yes, or even the public cloud provider. Right? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. In fact, um, that's where we have been largely focused. Uh, you know, as as the company has been, you know, marching towards this commercial availability, is working with, you know, all the top, you know, cloud service providers infrastructure as a service provider, software as a service provider, um, providers, and, and they're deploying it within their infrastructure that their customers are then, you know, taking advantage of. And it's, you know, giving them, giving them better performance, you know, better efficiency, you know, within their infrastructure and obviously better customer experiences. Um, you know, we've got uh, one very large, you know, SaaS provider, um, with uh, you know large, I think tens of thousands of MySQL instances for their customers, and um, and they've seen you know tremendous uh, improvements in you know latency, customer experience, you know reduced downtimes within their infrastructure, but again all supporting um, you know the software as a service model. And, and obviously these these customers, these SaaS uh, providers or MSPs. They also get the benefit of having to deploy less infrastructure while delivering more performance, right? Absolutely. You know, getting, and we do have, you know, examples, and we've got some case studies on the website that, that talk about these use cases where a service provider can basically, you know, get the same, same performance um, and, or better performance and even uh, higher capacity. Uh, you know, within the same footprint, reducing the server count, um, you know, from three to one, one server, uh, you know, and, and maybe a couple more SSDs, and they get, you know, tremendous um, uh, efficiencies in their, in their infrastructure. And it's not that they're going to rip, rip out, you know, the other two servers, it just allows them to scale, you know, more instances with its, within the same footprint. Or buying new servers, right? They don't necessarily have to, you know, buy new ones or as many new ones. Uh, it's Jason again here. Um, so the the whole idea of sort of distributed um, compute modules or distributed processing um, is is not necessarily new, but it's definitely taking off in the last few years. Um, so I, I really like the idea there. I just wondered if you could kind of go into a little bit more depth of sort of how you've done it without spilling all the secret sauce, I guess. But, you know, is this a FPGA, ASIC based? Is it ARM processor? Like what, what else is involved? It's a, a, a nice little black box, but, you know, uh, how, how is it done? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think it, it's no secret that you know in this phase of the product's evolution right fpgas offer you know tremendous advantages right for iterating you know quickly adding functionality quickly um you know getting to market quickly um but it's not a long-term you know scalable solution and the next step in the evolution is is obviously um asic and we're you know we're uh, heavily at, at work at that. That's where you know you get the economies of scale. Um, you know, bring the cost down, um, and <clears throat> the roadmap that we have, um, you know, from a processor perspective is it's amazing the the performance jumps right that um, you know we're expecting to get uh, going forward. But um, it, you know, in short, FPGA today, you know, moving to ASIC, that's a typical model in the industry. And I, I will say one other thing I'll add, obviously, you know, that's the vehicle, right? But it's the, it's the intelligence of 
you know, developing the software for the FPGA and the configuration of the FPGA, right? Our, our algorithms, our data structures, um, you know, experts, uh, you know, in, in our team uh, have been, you know, working in these areas for, for years and, um, you know, I've done an amazing job. It, it truly, it truly feels like magic sometimes because the numbers are so astounding, you know, in some cases, you know, but it's real. And, and we get, you know, there, there's quotes from customers, you know, that, that say, this is, you know, the best server side, you know, storage technology that they've seen, you know, in the last 10 years. Um, so I think that, that's about it, what I can tell you at this point. No, no, thank, thanks very much. That's a really informative answer. And, and you know, you, you, you say the right things in, in terms of like, yeah, the hardware is one thing, but the, the software that makes it all come together is, is, is just as important. Um, and, and I can see that you've, you know, you've got some big backing names there and you've got some of the heavy hitters of the industry behind you. So there's, uh, you know, clearly some trust and, and, and well thought of people looking into this. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Good question. Uh, I just had a quick question on the management of the solution. If I had more than one card deployed in the data center, can I, can I see that from a central location or can I use APIs to, to get information about my estate? How, what does that look like? Yeah. And then, so, you know, what we, <clears throat> when we configure a flap score, like, you know, so even whether there is a single flap score or multiple uh, flap score, the management and the interface and everything remains same. And uh, what we kind of do is, in fact, uh, is uh, to uh, reduce the effort required for individually managing uh, the SSDs. Let's imagine 24 SSDs, right? Like you have to figure out all the, right? Like which I've allocated. So we take care of abstracting all that SSDs and take care of the providing a, a common interface, like, you know, to tell that, okay, these are the SSDs, we will take care of it. And, uh, you know, how much volume, how much data you want to provide and everything. So it's just not only the acceleration, data protection, everything, the ease of management is another important component uh, that comes as part of the benefit uh, when it's been deployed at large scale. I'm going to start again. Another question in the, the sort of performance area. Um, you, you have a, a chunk of um, non-volatile memory on the, on the card. I'm assuming there's a, a bunch of metadata that's managed in there. Can you talk about the, the boundaries around you know, finite amount of memory and what that means in terms of system architecture, how many SSDs, how large they get, whether there's any boundaries in there because of that? Yeah, Alistair, so right now we support eight SSDs up to 128 terabyte of physical capacity. And uh, that logical capacity, depending upon the data compression, like, you know, it can go even higher. Uh, so that's that's the current model as we, uh, I think, uh, well, I was answering the Dan question. So we have been challenged on the capacity, not on the performance. So that's where we evolved our architecture supporting multiple flaps card in the server to go to the, the, the needs of the high density storage of or the hyperscalers. And uh, so that's how we uh, take care of it. And uh, maybe your second part of your question is like, you know, so how do we manage, uh, I mean, you know, these, uh, uh, right? Like if there is a, you know, maybe other question is, will there be any data loss or anything, right? So we, we take care of that, uh, you know, we have a, a super cap, like, you know, so if there is an event of any power failure on those things, this is completely protected. And uh, that data gets persisted into the SSB. So, so event of any of the power loss, there is absolutely, there is no data loss with respect to the, uh, you know, uh, it's a highly resilient architecture. Yeah, I was thinking more of the, uh, if there were performance impacts um, from, from that finite amount of RAM. And I guess the, the short answer is no, it's a capacity constraint rather than a performance constraint. Yes, absolutely, correct. Yeah, we have not challenged on so far, uh, even, Eight, eight SSDs we are front end ending, right? Like even this is one of the faster NVMEs. We are not challenged on like, you know, this is the aggregate sum of these SSD performance is higher than that of the what flaps can deliver. So that's, that's we, we already, um, you know, we have not hit that limit, but we are more challenged on the, the capacity of this. Uh, it's Jason again. And um, so early on in the presentation there, you um, made a comment about how the, power consumption in data centers can't continue to grow the way it has. And I'm, I'm a big fan of that 
idea. Um, so as such, do you support multiple architecture types? So, you know, it's generally the traditional x86 processor families that have seen the highest growth in power usage. And then we have the, the new or the, the, the broader adoption of um, things like ARM and RISC-V and other things like that, where we're seeing, especially hyperscalers, uh, AWS as an example, you know, the pushing out of Graviton processors to reduce their power footprint, um, really important. So are you supported on both of those um, or, or multiple architecture types? Uh, let me let me give my my answer. Very good question. Um, today it's it's really um, x86. You know, in terms of you know testing and validation, right? That's been done. I don't think anything is off the table, right? Uh, uh, you know, when when there's a need, you know, for us to um, you know put resources on that, um, you know. And I'll say, and the opportunity, you know, is big enough. Clearly, you know, there there are there's movement in you know in that direction. You know, we'll certainly you know want to want to support you know the industry as as things evolve. All right. Well, thanks everybody for a lot of great questions. Um, it was a pleasure talking with you. And um, as I said before, you know, commercial availability was announced July 27th. The stores open. You know, come and get them. Thank you very much.